First of all, thanks for being here, not for running away from time to call it here. Um, I'm, hope I'm keep keeping the time, and uh, as, as you already mentioned, I'm not alone, so uh, present the work uh, not only of us three, so not only me, David, and Ethan, but also of uh, other colleagues from uh, the numismatic. Um, so, an island in the, in the ocean of data. Um, let's see. So, uh, here we have a small picture. Uh, you see the, the brownish, that's, that's a numismatic island. You also see, you don't see the full scope of the island because I cannot present the whole island. It would take too long and I'm probably not the right person to do so. Um, but I, what I would like to show you is uh, uh, Numisma.org. I think most of you might heard of it. It's uh, a group of numismatists since already several years sitting together defining the concepts that are needed for numismatic um, discipline. And what they do, they they take the concepts. So what is what is the authority who's allowed to to generate a coin, and so they generate uh, these concepts. Uh, in the linked open data format. So they generate URIs and everybody can link to this URI and say, okay, I want to have this authority and this is a numismatic concept for it. That's the goal of numismatic Um That's kind of a central place on the island. Um, then Ethan is, for example, working on uh, Ochre, which is online coinage for Roman emperors. So there we have a catalog of all different coin types that were generated in the um, Roman Empire. I will also show a little bit on uh, another area of coinage, which is more to the coin finds. So not just the coins itself, but also with some context. And uh, those coins that are digged for a thousand of years in, in, in the mud and don't look any very pretty anymore. Um, and the idea is how to link all those things together. That's one part of the story. And the other part is how to link this island to, to other areas, to other um, domains, and so on. So how does it function at the moment? Um, Ochre and also Antique uh, Fünfels in Europa, which is uh, basically the work of David and me. Uh, we are using what is pro produced by Prisma.org and us. Um, there is, in addition to the concepts, we define an apology to build up what is uh, to express what we have there. And we use those ideas and the apology then to communicate between each other. And what we do, we produce data sets, so all the databases are then transformed in an according way to interact with each other. And these data sets are then collected also under the frame of numisma.org. Um, these data sets are not only coming from us, so there are much more, you'll see it later, uh, which is you, uh, Valencia, Berlin, and so on. And those data sets are then further used in Ochre to do things. They're also used in numisma. And so this already connects the world of inside the coinage. But of course, we also have the bridges. So here I try to draw a bridge um, to, to the more general places like your names for, for place information, Wikidata, uh, Getty, uh, Getty uh, DBpedia on that level. And there are other bridges on, on different other levels as well. For example, from the coin find information, we have the links to Deutsche Archaeological Institut Gazette here, so also are again uh, for places, but also to bibliography and uh, those things. Okay. Now comes the tricky part. David generated a small video of how this works really in action. And let's see if this is uh, showing up on the screen up there or on the screen here. It's as I expected. I need to move this over. There it is. Okay. So 
since it's stopping at the moment. Uh, it starts in Ochre, what we have seen on the island on the upper right. And uh, David was entering there the 777, so searching for a specific coin type. And the 777 is then used by different um, authorities. One of them is, uh, I need to go here, Vespasian. So he then clicks on this coin type for Vespasian. He gets all the information in, in Ochre. Um, he gets maps as well. And you see here the different uh, coins that are imported from different data sets from Valencia, uh, from Münzkabel in Berlin. And there is, for example, RFE, so the, um, what we are working on without a picture, unfortunately. We are working on that. And here you also see the find spot, so exactly where this coin was found. You can click on it and you will end up in a way, in a, on the, I need to, quick, 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 no, <laughs> I was too slow. You end up in, in here, which is the RDF representation on the RFE database for this coin. And uh, in, in the back end, to have some technical, in the back end there's a traditional relational database and it just mapped by a, by a mapping file um, to this uh, representation. That's not needed to, okay. But then there is also um, a human readable version of it that you see here with all the different very granular way of uh, representing the coinage, what all the numismatists I think it's relevant. You see here it's then further linked again back to nomisma.org. You see here the, the concept of denarius that is presented here. And here you again see the data sets, so some of the examples of a denarius are shown within nomisma. And then from RFE, you, you have the find spot. So you have the information about the find spot. But there you also have the link then to the Gazetteer of the Deutsche Archäologische Institut, which is there. <laughs> and suddenly you, you're not, not only more bound just coins, because you can here look to bibliography uh, of all kinds that is related to this fine spot. So it's not just coins anymore, it can be anything. And then you also have to, uh, in, in this system, the connection to the objects of Ariadne. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, for this find spot, there are no find, uh, objects in Ar Ariasna uh, included, so you don't find anything. But that's the way how their coins are linked to, to other areas, to other disciplines. Okay. Then I need to get rid of this movie. Okay. Okay, so we have these bridges to other disciplines, and I think there are, there are various bridges that are kind of natural or, or quite easy to do, like you have places, latitude, longitude, you have single persons, you have time, you have the literature, we have just seen the literature, you have material, or bronze, or silver, or something, but if you start thinking of this is, uh, this is an easy task, you'll probably run uh, against the wall because it's not. <laughs> uh, because uh, whatever you take, if you take a place, which is, I, I think places are more, more, most with the new key system since years around, more, most of, the, of you know, uh, there are various names for the same place, um, there are regions including other places, there are overlappings, and so on. Persons, Somebody is talking about Octavian, other about somebody else who talks about Augustus. Um, might be the same person, but it also be that someone wants to say, okay, when I talk about Octavian, I mean somebody who was not the emperor, or at least before the time he turned up to be the emperor. Uh, this is just um, Or for example, as here in the in the slide, I have the, uh, the places and mixture up with the, with the time. Yeah, I think in Paris there was also 
uh, a session about what is a period. It's also depending on where you are. In some regions you have freeze periods, in some others you don't. <laughs> okay? Um, so, in, in nomisma.org, when we, there's a steering committee and we sit together, we try to sit together uh, every two weeks in a, in a conference hall and we discuss various things and this is one of the things we discussed rather recently. So there's, uh, there's a city called uh, Istanbul. We uh, even been there, so uh, I know where it is, but uh, the concept of Istanbul is quite different to the concept of Byzantium or, or Constantinople, uh, at least for, for the people thinking of points. And uh, in fact, we are not thinking of the city itself, for the, the mismatches, it's important to have the mint, so the place where the coin was produced specifically. And for some of the numismatists, the they don't really bother about it. They say it's a place, it's a geolocation. And we don't care about the semantic difference between those two. But some do. So then we are, we are starting having a conflict. And this needs to be discussed. Uh, we decided at the moment to, to have all three of them. We are not finished in discussion. Uh, we used uh, uh, from the W3C a provenance uh, ontology to somehow deal with it. Uh, but I think this, this, uh, this is already the, the interesting part where you switch from, from pure data to the semantic level. And this is always where it, it gets more, more of a burden to come over. Um, what I also would like to, to stress is um, talking a little bit about ontology. Um, uh, on, a, on a very high level, I'm not going too much into detail. Uh, but I would like to, to explain the process we, we had to build up our ontology and what, uh, what problems also we had doing so. Um, and I would like to start in, in, in categorizing ontologies in a kind of way, way very unstructured, very flexible to be extremely structured and then the same way be less flexible. So what do I mean by this? Uh, let's say W4 terms, I think most of you have heard of. Uh, I just put them somewhere in the middle, so there's no left and right end, so I think that's okay. Uh, what, I, what I mean here is um, coming from the angle that I'm a computer scientist, and back in 1999 I developed an RDF browser, where I took RDFXML as input, and every time I receive a resource, I ask the question, okay, a resource, what are you? Which class should I put you? Uh, what the normal thing you do there is, okay, you're used with this property. Okay, so you're used with computer, so you must be an agent. And I put it in the agent class. What you see here, it's, uh, for this property, it's only the duration time. So the domain is not defined. So the domain could be any resource. So it's not specified. So if we use, for example, SCOS, then most of the properties have both the range and the domain defined. So when I define my parser, I would say, oh, have a resource. You are used to the past top concept. So the um, subject must be a concept theme and the object must be a concept. Easy. And therefore, I put SCOS on the right hand side of these two terms because it's more structured. If you use it, if you use this property in any way of modeling, it would mean that this should be, should be true. There are always two ways of looking at those RDF domain and range. One is to say, I infer this class membership out of the usage, okay? And the second would be to use it as a really uh, data quality issue. Are you really in this class? Is it defined somewhere? If not, I put a red flag that's jumping wrong. Okay. Something that is even more on the right hand side of SCOS would, in my view, be CyberSQL. 
they not only have to maintain range conditions, they also impose uh, this event-based thinking, as Bob mentioned in the keynote at the very beginning uh, this morning. Um, so they're more strict, which also means they're more structured. It's more easy to inter interact with each other, to integrate, which is the reason for having side of CM, so that's fine. Um, but the, the purpose of numisma.org was quite different, and so for this reason, see there was some space to that. We are on, on the opposite side. So we started to be extremely flexible. And I'm not sure if 2012 is 100% correct, but uh, when I arrived to nomisma.org, I looked, that's it, interesting. Um, it works, they produce something, so it must be good, but it's, it, it was not what I was taught to do and was used to do, it was totally different. They basically had, they had no ontology, there was no ontology, um, they simply use stuff and they mix it up. So they use things for property or as a class definition, so it was quite, quite of a mix. So we, we had long discussions on those phone calls saying um, this is not very structured and it's kind of messy and, um, and others liked it because it was flexible and you can use anything and there's no error in it because it's flexible. Um, so after long discussion, uh, we ended up uh, turning a little bit to the right, saying, okay, we need some structure because also at that point in time, um, the, the number of concepts, the number of, of elements of, of various classes was growing and growing and growing and we need something to, to deal with that. To handle it. Um, what we came up with in uh, this point in time was, was an ontology. Uh, but as you see, we still left hand side from some easy terms. So we really try to keep keep away any any force that forces you to to have this element in some certain class. So you in our ontology you will not find uh, IDF domain or IDF range restriction or definitions. The beauty of that, and, and so I learned a lot by this, these conversations as well, so I moved my position a little, uh, saying, no, okay, I accept that we don't always need to have IDF range and domain. Um, then you can use, for example, in this case, the property um, NMO, so this is a Two minutes. Okay, time to hurry up. Um, thanks. Um, property, you can attach it to a resource that represents a coin, but you can also attach it to uh, any other resource that in the second picture, for example, represents an event. And on the other hand, on the range, you can attach it to the coin, uh, to, to, a, to a generic element with, that has no class definition or, or anything else. So you're free to model whatever you want. And this, uh, this freedom, I think, is also in research is very important. So I'm skipping this a little bit. Um, however, when you then want to interact and exchange information, you need to be more precise. So there in the uh, nomisma.org, you have some definition and explanation how we interact. So it's explained there. So then the freedom is kind of gone. Um, you have here the ontology description. You have here a description of the a list of the data sets are available. And then you have, uh, we use, for example, um, the void uh, ontology to then deal with the data sets, how to maintain them. So there is a description of the data set itself. And in the data, you have for each resource that is described, um, an according uh, in data set representation, so we can also think of a, it as a labeled graph kind of thing. Okay, and that, that helps to manage it. So then Ethan, on, on the, working on the back end of Nomisma.org, is able to really say, okay, this data set has been updated, has new items in it, improved items, 
So get rid of those and load the new ones in. Oof, at the end I was a little bit hurrying, but I think I made it in two minutes. <laughs> uh, and here's a part of the island of the Muspatic Island again, and I hope uh, you enjoyed my talk. Thanks. <laughs>